In this video, I'm going to show you how to make this Flappy Bird knockoff, mostly from the perspective of a Unity developer who just started learning Godot. So I'm likely to get things wrong or call things in Godot using its Unity alternative. Disclaimer, all the art assets are from itch.io and things I will talk about are summaries of various get started with Godot tutorials and Google searches. So the solution is most definitely not original. So let's get started with the scene structure to get a better grasp of the project. We're going to have a camera with custom script for screen shake, a player node or scene, or in Unity's terms, a game object to handle the player logic, then pipe spawners to handle the spawning of pipe prefabs, or in Godot's terms, again, just saved assets called scenes. Then there is going to be parallax background, colliders, heads up display for score, and finally, our custom shader canvas layer for handling the cycle between day and sunset. Firstly, the gameplay loop. In reaction survival games like Flappy Bird, which are basically infinite, you don't usually want to move the player, but rather the environment. So we'll take a look at our pipe object. Due to the theme, the pipes are different for the upper and lower part, but the only change is the collision shape for area 2D node that offers us to check whether two objects overlap the same space. In between the two parts, there is another area that when collided with, will increase the player's score. Let's take a closer look at the pipe controller script. As stated previously, with Flappy Bird-like games, we want to move the environment and delete it if it passes a certain point on screen. That's why we adjust the position every single frame slightly to the left, and once it reaches the value of our off-screen coordinate variable, which in case of this game represents the x-axis to the left, we delete the object using QFree method. You might see that I also have my own resource class, which is sort of like a scriptable object in Unity. This class, called void channel resource, only has one variable of type action. Action is a delegate, and you can think of it as a variable that points you to a different function or functions as far as I know. The method contained in the class invokes or runs the functions that are associated with the action. In the case of pipe controller, we assign stop movement function to our void channel resource. The trigger for this function is handled by our player script that calls the race event method if it collides with the pipe or ground. All of this works by creating a resource of type void channel resource in our file system and assigning it to their variables. In our case, we call it on player hit. This is an example of the observer pattern. Our player doesn't know who listens to it, whether it gets hit or not, and we don't need to cross-reference our scripts that way. Also, this makes debugging and unit testing much simpler, as you can single out your objects and test them separately. Since we discussed the pipe controller, now let's go over the spawning mechanics. This one also uses our on-hit player resource, but it makes the spawner not working. Spawning mechanic itself is just instantiating a pipe prefab or packed scene, setting its position on Y axis using random number generator, and finally adding it to the scene under the root of the tree using get tree, that root, that get node, the name of the root node, that add child, and the variable name. Important thing to note here is the override of exit tree method. When adding a function to the invocation list of a delegate, it is important to remove it. If the lifespan of the owner of the function added is shorter than the lifespan of the objects invoking the action. Also, for the timing of spawning, a timer object is used and a timeout signal in the node window is created for the pipe spawner object. Now for the player. First of all, the scripts inherits from character body 2D and there is only vertical movement applied by checking the input from user. We can set our own input actions in the project settings. While the actual input checking could probably be done using the standard process method instead of physics process, it's not that big of a deal. You can get your project gravity setting using project settings.get setting, and if you hover your mouse over a setting, you get the string path to it. For the collision detection using areas, we use area entered signal on the player area. By placing various objects in different groups, which is done in the node tab, we can create a simple if else tree for various kinds of objects that the player can interact with, like the score checkpoint, pipe, or the ground. In case of player colliding with the pipe or the ground, firstly we change the sprite animation, 
we disable the player's physics collision using set deferred method, apply a custom pushback vector, and for the animation, we create a tween. Now, tweens are all about what happens in between two things and are incredibly powerful. In case of this game, after player collides with a pipe, we use it to rotate the player and invoke the action in our custom class. As for the score, it's just an integer value we keep incrementing, but this time we use a custom channel resource that sends string data. The only current listener in this scene is the score manager. Oh, and if you want to have an easier time with complex string creation, for your huts, for example, you can use an instance of a string builder from the system that texts. The score manager just listens to the player's score change and updates its text accordingly. The screen shake effect of the camera also listens to the player hit event, but the effect itself is achieved by rapidly changing the offset in random directions. As for the parallax effect, we first need to set up a couple of nodes like parallax background as well as parallax layer for every depth layer. You can place your sprites as children of the parallax layer and adjust the scale as well as the mirroring under motion in inspector. As for making the background seem like it's scrolling without the player moving, we're going to adjust the scroll base offset of the parallax background every frame. Now for the sunset shader. Firstly, we create a canvas layer with color rectangle node as its child. Then we create new shader material for it and a new shader. The shader itself is just a simple adjustment of color values, but we also need to swap out the background sprites for their sunset variation. As for triggering the change, you can just create a signal and note and hook it to the class responsible for handling the sprites, which would be the parallax controller in my case. And that's how you create a floppy bird knockoff. Anyways. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.